you know, for me, that's the most powerful when you really start to, to, to know who you are. And when, when you get that knowledge, you can start to operate when you're at your best and play to your strengths. And for me, limiting beliefs is a big one. And, and that kind of runs through all of the coaching sessions, especially in sales that I've ever done. Unless you believe there's going to be a positive outcome to this call, this meeting, this month, whatever it is, there's no point in getting started because you've already made the decision that you're going to fail before you even take the first step. Philosophy is a big fluffy word. How do you do leadership, Anna? It took me a long time to think about this, actually. Welcome to the How They Lead podcast, hosted by Benjamin Wade and Ben Stocker. This podcast is dedicated to exploring the world of high performance, showcasing examples of how individuals and teams can reach their full potential. Together, they'll be inviting amazing guests who have defined or represented high performance in their own right. From world record breakers to individuals who have achieved first in their fields, the How They Lead podcast will showcase a diverse range of guests, each with their unique stories and insights to share. So join us as we challenge traditional ways of doing things, explore new ideas, methods and possibilities, and evolve the way people perform. Another episode of How They Lead, and our listeners now know that we invite guests from mainstream frontline leadership positions, but people who they might not have heard from before. And this episode is no different. We've invited Hannah, Hannah Keep, to come and talk to us. I think on last count, I saw nine different amazing experiences, including a lockdown startup business platform, which I'm intrigued to hear more about. But I'd like to pass over to yourself, Hannah, and hear a little bit more about you, who you are, and how we're fortunate enough to have you on our latest episode. No, well, thank you both for having me. I've been really looking forward to this as well. Um, like my role at the moment, I'm um, CRO at uh, the Index Group, um, which is um, a group of staffing brands. But I think most people will know me as a as a recruitment uh, trainer and coach. Uh, 18 years of my life doing that, and then during lockdown, I set up my own uh, recruitment agency called Agility. So you, you said yeah, nine different things on my profile. There's there's been quite a few, but I guess uh, recruitment is the common theme as well as um, coaching and, of course, leadership, which we're here today to chat. Yeah, great. Hannah, lovely to have you on on How They Lead. Um, I've been really looking forward to this one. I've been wanting to pick your brains for a while. So um, so I've got you, got you captured and surrounded now. Um, I'm really interested, just to kick us off. So um, CRO at Index, what the hell's a CRO? Yeah, that's a really good question. In fact, every week I have to sit down and just remind myself, actually... What is it? But, um, the purpose is um, to help our brands make more money. In a nutshell, um, that's yeah, that that's what I'm here to do. And it could mean a variety of things, from startup brands to helping them with their um, go-to-market strategy. What what products are we launching with? What actually is the market? How can we dominate it? Messaging um, to working with the existing brands and doing my favorite thing, which is basically spotting all the gaps looking at where we're leaking money, um, closing the gaps, um, and trying to make everybody better. Nice. Sounds brilliant. How, how many brands are you responsible for, just for our, our listeners? Uh, six at the moment, yeah. Okay, cool. And um, for lay people like me, a CRO is a chief revenue officer. Is that That's right? That's it, yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. That's where the money bit comes in. Yeah. That's where the money bit comes in. Okay, great. So um you've got like a vast amount of, of of practical and demonstrable recruitment training coaching experience how does how does that translate to uh, a chief revenue officer role which a number of people might see as like you know comes from someone who's who's done a, a sales director role or a bdm role within a recruitment or search business so how did you how did you go on that journey i'm kind of defining the journey you know as we go um the role kind of appeal to all of my strengths I mean you said like recruitment there there's you know there's there's coaching there um business development is probably one of my most favorite activities um on the planet so it, it, like it you know and it, and building things right so it, it appeals to to all of my strengths but um I, I'm kind of wanting to take it in a bit of a new direction and bring and, and almost redefine learning and development as well um, so the, the actual team that I'm responsible for is revenue and performance. And we chose not to call our L&D team L&D. It is revenue and performance. So whatever we do, there's a clear link between the activity um, and bringing in more revenue. Um, so my role touches on obviously sales, but also, you, you know, marketing to systems uh, as, as well as to people. 
um, it's really quite an exciting journey to go on because I, I think it's quite new to the industry, actually, as in recruitment, um, but more likely to sales enablement, I guess, if you look outside of, of recruitment. Yeah. And was it a passion for coaching that you started off with or did you end up in recruitment as, as one of your first roles? What was the, the start of that journey that Ben mentioned? Well, yeah, sales was first, but then, yeah, and then into recruitment. Um, and then when I left um, age 26 to go traveling, I, I came back and actually joined my mum in her business. And she had um, a really successful leadership and exec coaching um, business. So um, she said, what are you going to do when you get back? I'm like, I don't know. She said, could you just do some sales for us? I'm like, yeah, okay, I'll get you some appointments. And I just fell in love with the whole concept of I guess, personal effectiveness, self-leadership, leadership, and then went on this long journey of uh, of getting qualified. Um, I, I don't have a traditional degree. My degree is in everything to do with this, you know, whether that's NLP, coaching, psychometrics. Um, yeah, and that's how the journey started. And actually, I, I fell back into recruitment in um, that crash in 2008 uh, where we lost a lot of our exec coaching clients overnight because they're all in banking. And it was like, oh, what are you going to do now? Uh, what can I do? Um, and I actually wrote a book um, all about resilience. And, and a few people found me from my past. And they're like, Hannah, could you come and do some recruitment training for us? And I'm like, yeah, I'll do that. Um, and that was 18, well, how many, many years ago it was. So, yeah, um, discuss the journey. And then I, I went back on the tools during COVID. Um, it's been a long time since I actually did hands-on recruitment. And that was a chance for me to go, right, have you still got it? Yeah, you know, can you still do this? And it was a completely different world of recruitment. Now we're like automation and um, LinkedIn recruiter, um, not the fax machine and like basic email that we had all those years ago. Yeah. You, you mentioned uh, EI and NLP um, and sort of communication, resilience, etc. Is there anything that you have covered had the biggest impact or that you've seen the, the biggest impact? Say for our listeners at home, what could they concentrate on from those four or five quite deep topics that you've just mentioned? Anything that you would say had the biggest impact? Yeah, it has to start with emotional intelligence, isn't it? And I, you know, and the element of um, self leadership um, and really understanding yourself from a yeah a really deep perspective. As it, you, you know, what why do I why do I do that? Uh, why do I make those decisions? Um, what what's the thinking? Um, what are the patterns of behaviour that I have? Um, why am I at my best then and why am I not that, you know, that whole self-reflective piece to really understand, you know, who you are, what you're about, what's important to you, um, what your purpose is and being really aligned internally. Um, yeah, and that, that's a long journey, right? And I'm still on, I'm still on that journey now. I'm still discovering, you know, more things, but you know, for me, that's the most powerful when you really start to, to, to know who you are. And when, when you get that knowledge, you can start to operate you know, from when you're at your best and play to your strengths. And um, for me, limiting beliefs is a big one. And, and that kind of runs through all of the coaching sessions, especially in sales that I've ever done. And, you know, it's like, you know, in, unless you believe there's going to be a positive outcome to this call, this meeting, this month, whatever it is, you know, you, you, there's no point even getting started because you've already made the decision that you're going to fail um, before you even take the first step. Um, yeah, so, yeah, that, that, that those things really are very powerful, I think. Yeah, I think um, we'll come back to self-leadership piece. I'm not going to get away with that one because that, that's one of our pillars we're going to talk about. But there's something you just mentioned there on the on the sales side. So we, we do we do a bunch of work with, with with businesses who, of course, in like the market conditions right now, like we are in September 2023, um, sales, um, profitability, cash flow are super important for, for every business. Um, and um, I read a post this morning, actually, from someone that we probably both know on LinkedIn that said um, it was about recruiters, but I think it translates to everyone in sales that actually the worst thing you can have is a plan B. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and it just completely resonated with me because when you, you talked about limiting beliefs then, and I think one of the things that can really hamper people overcoming those limiting beliefs is having a really easy plan B. It's like, well, I'll try sales or I'll try, you know, recruitment, whatever this might be, but I can always go and do that. And I think that I found that really interesting in some of the work that we've done internally for us as a business on sales. Like we are a sales business, like, you know, um, to look at, well, actually like 
well, there, there isn't a plan B. Like you, you kind of, we're, we're both in, we are all in. Um, send that, yourself up for failure, really, aren't you? Yeah, you send yourself up for failure and be able to iterate. But that that that's a really, I find that quite freeing. It's like great, we've identified, you know, our, our target market, our ideal customer avatar, etc. Like, here's a list. Here's some phone numbers. Like, go because otherwise, you, you don't you don't pay your mortgage. So I think that there's an interesting bit there around understanding your why, as you said, um, understanding what limited beliefs are, but then thinking about personal responsibility. Um, as well, which hopefully brings us back to to self leadership. So, on that note, um, what's your like? What's your philosophy? Is a big fluffy word. Um, how do you do leadership, Hannah? Mm. Took me a long time to think about this. Actually, when you set me set me through the, the brief, because you you come up with the, the the answers that you think, oh, is that textbook, or is that you know what people want to hear? But you know, if I'm really really truthful with myself. Um, there's two elements to it. The first one is leading by example. That's who I am. Um, and I try to do it, you know, every single day and, and I'm at my best when I can. I don't like it when I'm really hands off. Um, for me, I, I would rather show, um, rather than tell. And, and in fact, before this call, I was just calling some candidates actually <laughs> for a job that, that I'm not, um, cause you don't really need some interviews on the board. So I'm like, I'd be quite happy to, to contribute to that. Um, but leading by example is really important to me. That's that's first ethos. And and I'm just very supportive. I, I am a coach by trade and by training, but I, I've always been that way. That is who I am. And so um, I would rather coach somebody to get to where they want to be um, rather than tell, drag, shout, you know, everything else. So it's, yeah, it's that my, uh, the CEO of our business would say I probably need to like be a bit a bit tougher perhaps, but he he can do that bit. I'm the nurturing supporter coach, the by example one. <laughs> we have another client who that that will resonate with. Uh, they have an issue or a challenge where they want to show as well and and operate under that coaching style that you mentioned, but they always want to show. So it's really difficult to take that step back because they can do it quicker, easier, more effectively. So how do you broach that, that you can't always show? Sometimes you do need to take that step back. Do you find that difficult or is that quite easy for you? It, 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 it is easy because I think the alternative is you just get very, very stressed and everybody is really unhappy. And actually a sign of where I'm on that, where I'm going to then burn out or I'm not at my best is when I start taking over and, I, and I've learned that over the last couple of years. So if I start doing a lot of telling and taking things over and, you know, I know that this is not going to end in a good place. So that's like a, that's like my warning sign. Um, so I'm quite, I'm quite comfortable with it. I, it, it, it's much better to watch somebody uh, implement what you've just gone through in a coaching session than, than, than take it over. Um, but I, what I enjoy is, um, is just showing that I can still do this. And I don't know whether it's for them so that they can learn from it or whether it is just me and I just get general enjoyment out of it. So bring me on a meeting, let me do a big call, um, let me do a couple of my own, you know, business deals on the side. And, I, you know, and I, and I like that. And do you have anything in place that reminds you that you are getting a bit too hands-on or, or task-focused and to take a step back? Or is that the, the team that you're working with, you've got that trust and rapport for them to say, Hannah, you're getting hands on again. Back off. I think, I think they would actually like me, like to have more answers. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't, it wouldn't come from there. And it's really hard in recruitment when you've got so much knowledge to not go. We'll do this, say that. Um, it's, it's, it's something. It's something inside of me when I, when my emails start getting longer and more directional, uh, <laughs> then I know it's time to read. Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> So if you ever if you're if you're in in index and you ever get emails from Hannah that have numbered bullet points, <laughs> you know you know you're in trouble. Lots of you know you're in trouble. Points, yeah. Um, cool. That, that, I mean that that's it, it's so important because you know we're we're aware that um, a proportion of the people that, that listen and watch the podcast are emerging leaders, so first time team leaders, etc. And that's a real it's a real skill that you've had to learn habitually, I imagine, because. You know, you're going from people who are generally individual contributors, whether they're in sales or, or other roles, and then typically they're, they're they're exceptional. They get promoted, and it's like great, be responsible for for other people. So that 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 initial bit from being responsible for your own contributions to then being responsible for enabling the performance of other people, I think is a really it's a really hard paradigm to switch quickly. 
And so I think what I've just taken from you is it, it takes time, it takes battle scars, it takes feedback, et cetera, to, to be able to, to be able to do that. Um, and, and so in your role at the moment, you, you very, you very kind of eloquently positioned that the, the team is about revenue and performance rather than learning and development. Um, what's the difference? Okay, I'll give you a really practical example of this. So we are we're building out a new onboarding program. Me and my my, my colleague who who runs that side of things, and um, we created it as any L and D person would. And you got all your topics and your timetables, and we got assessments in there. And you know we have it, it looked great. And then um, Dan, a CEO of our business, he's like, okay, so you you put here you want them to do a placement by X day. Well, how are they going to do it? And I'm like, well, this is how. We're going to train them. We're going to teach them and they're going to do it. And he's like, you haven't broken it back. So what is it that you need in order to do a deal? Yeah, let's look at our ratios right now. So how many outbound messages, how many calls, how many, you know, let, let's break it absolutely down step by step. And he's right. You know, and I missed that because I'd gone straight into what we're going to teach them, what they're going to learn, how are we going to coach them rather than actually how do we get, you know, what's the end point? Um, so that is that's that's a real example you know and every activity needs to be measurable and have a business impact so again we're looking at all of our coaching sessions and i'm saying okay so how do we measure these how do we quantify that they've been a success well we're not taking feedback so we could take actions and i'm like well not every action should relate in an improvement in a ratio um everything they do whether it's the introductions on a call or how they're handling objections there should there should be an outcome and we can look at that in the ratio. And then what's the oh, what's the longer term outcome of that? Well, you know, we should see more business coming through. So it's just making sure that everything that we do, this has a tangible benefit to the business and can be quantified in some way. Mm -hmm. How many of those conversations we had recently? <laughs> I think probably what, one a week for as long as I can remember with the sales teams we're supporting. And they say exactly that. It's It's actually so common that these sales teams don't break it down to how many phone calls a day, how many emails should be sent in order to achieve that target. Yeah. Well, often they're doing well, but actually they could be doing so much better if they really broke it down into the, the task level. Yeah. They're so common, more common than actually you, you'd realize. That. Yeah. Look at, look at what's working and do more of that. Yeah, completely. I think, you know, you've just talked there about reverse engineering, like, you know, start, start with the end in mind and then, and then work backwards. It is very easy yeah, you're right to to kind of have a, um, a a classical learning and development. What are the skills required? What's the program? What's the assessment? What's the embedding? But actually, like really, the, the results are where the rubber hits the road. So you know, what do we want to achieve, and then reverse engineer that back. And you mentioned ratios there, which I'm a huge fan of in terms of looking at you know quantity and quality. And then you talked about plugging revenue gaps, etc. Like they really help with that. So where do you, so for all, all leaders, um, I can't remember who the quote is, but like someone said, measure what matters. I'm, I'm going to kick myself. I don't remember what the quote is. Um, like where, where do you stand on, on, on KPIs or measurements, et cetera? Like what, what's, what's your perspective on those? Well, it, is it in, it's expect what you inspect. That's, that's one of them, isn't it? Um, I, I, I'm a massive fan. I, you know, I, I'm XS3. We, you know, we were brought up on, on KPIs. Um, if you don't have a KPI, then you don't have a ratio. Um, if you want to teach someone something, they need to do enough of it before you, they can then get better. So enough of it is the KPI, isn't it? And then to get better, you know, we're looking at, we're looking at the ratios. Um, you don't need hundreds of them. You probably only need between four and six KPIs, depending on, you know, what your, what your role is. Um, but for me, they are the roadmap to success. You, you can't tell me that anybody out there, whether they're business or, I don't know, tennis, football, horse, you know, whatever whatever it is, there is data. Um, data is used for people to get better, for us to be more effective, faster, more efficient. Um, so huge, huge fan. I think one of the questions that have come up from that, that statement is a lot of our clients and our listeners has have the data, have it readily available, but might not necessarily know how to use it or how to effectively discuss it. So how, how do you take that wealth of information knowledge and use it? Is it through one-to-ones, performance reviews? How frequently do you undertake those? Because that's often the, the forgotten bit, isn't it? Mm. That second half, you've got the data, what do you do with it? Well, yeah, well, you've got to get the data, haven't you? Um, and that that is that is another issue because then you need people to actually be putting things on the CRM 
um, so that you actually have accurate data. Um, but let, let's suppose that they are, and we're on a journey with this. We're at the moment, we're going back to basics. We're looking at every process, every system, changing it, re-embedding it, um, making it better. But let's suppose that they are using it. Um, that will be in my weekly conversations. It will be in monthly reviews. It'll be every time somebody sets um, some sort of action and I want to make it smarter. I mean, just this morning, someone sent me through their six non-negotiables. So I'm saying, let's have, you know, let's have them. And it's like, well, I need to, I want to get five um, interviews booked, as in her going to be pre-screening candidates for this job. I'm like, okay, well, that that's, that's the outcome. Um, but what do you need to do to get there? So let's look at your current ratios. Now that's that's what you need to do from um, an input perspective to get that output. But that's on your ratios. That's not me telling you how many you need to do. <clears throat> that's what he your history tells us. Um, it's the same. We've got someone just transitioning into um, like an, more of an account management role. Um, so she's given me her targets to the end of the year. And I said, well, you know, how, how are we going to do that? We need to break that down based on your um, to our interview to placement ratio, but we need to take it based on this client because this is the client you're managing. So we'll pull the data from the beginning of the year to now. That's how many interviews this client will need in order for you to make one placement unless you improve or influence something which, you know, will improve the ratio. So for me, it's like, it's making the data meaningful to that person and you can't lie or argue with the data. The data doesn't lie. You can't argue with it. That is what you've done to now. So if, if you, you know, if you want to do this, these are the steps um, or you just need to get much better at something if you, if you don't want to increase the volume. Yeah. And I think, um, I think it's, I, I found it really interesting in that process, like going through that process. And then having those objections coming up from people internally to say, oh, but uh, I just haven't put those client meetings in or, or actually I've got, a, I've, I've got a candidate that's a final stage that I haven't, I haven't put in yet. Cause that then, that then kind of, um, highlights the, the necessity to make sure that your, your CRM data is really, really clean. Cause otherwise you can't improve your performance. You're kind of, it's kind of luck. Like you might, you might pull a placement out of a hat one month or, or you might not, um, and then, and then when you translate that into those people leading people, unless they've got that nailed down, how the hell do they hold someone else accountable for their, their performance um, and support, coach, develop, and, and nurture them? Um, so I think I think that that data piece is is really important, and like we're firm believers in in in, in KPIs, performance measurements, basically from our backgrounds, like rugby and, and RAF, like you know you you get measured. Like you just do, and that's and that that's how you improve. Measure it and do something about it. Yeah. So that'd be a, a question back to you. How? What do you have in place, or what framework or process to ensure that your sort of feedback and action loop is as tight and as effective as possible? Is there something that you you anchor yourself to? Um. In well, we're just we we are using um an HR system to record all of the training and coaching sessions. So um so everything become, becomes joined up between me. Um, the consultant, the consultant's manager, and then um, our L and D manager. So everything is getting tracked and, and and measured. So we're constantly looking for, you know, have we got that improvement? Are we seeing what we need to see? That's all right. I think, and, I, and that that kind of, you know, that transparency of accountability across those key stakeholders is is so important and often and often missed. Um, I can't remember who who it was, but like it was like a month ago. I was sitting down with with someone. I was like, okay, so how do you um? Th it was it was a leader who was having problems with holding themselves accountable for the actions that came out of the one to ones with with their team members. And my first question was, well, one well, my first piece of feedback was like, great that you're having one to ones. What happens in those one to ones? Which is a whole other story. Like, you know, whatever happens, happens. I was like, okay, well, we can focus on on how you can use agenda driven one to ones to to create a structure who who feeds back into those but then when it came to the actions it was kind of like well they get written down sometimes i email them across sometimes i don't and my simple answer was like do you use teams it's like yes we use teams i was like why don't you just create a teams channel and then have the actions in there and and have have your team member put the actions in and then they hold you accountable for your ones and vice versa and we began that as a process of, of behavioral change and, and open accountability, very simple. 
Um, and my next coaching session with that leader, how's that going? Like, oh, so, so I was like, well, look, you're only, you're only just getting going. So allow me to hold you accountable for the new behavior. And kind of, you know, a month later, I checked in with him earlier this week. It's like, actually, we're already beginning to see some traction, but you kind of need, as you've just described, you know, HR platforms are, are great now for having different people that can see actions and accountability. And I think that's, that's a really important piece of, well, praise as well as, 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 as behavioral and, and performance change. Um, Hannah, I'm going to move us on a bit. You talk, you've talked a lot about, you know, you're working with, with different functions in the business, different, different stakeholders. So as a, as a leader within the business, how, what are the building blocks for you of, of really being able to kind of collaborate well with other leaders in the business? Well, just, just to talk, um, and, and, and to make sure that you've got time regularly scheduled. I mean, it's, there's nothing more sophisticated than that. Um, Otherwise, you've got different people doing different things and some people perhaps maybe doing the same thing um, and not knowing. So it, it's just communicating regularly, whether that's weekly or, or quarterly and sharing um, kind of what what our objectives are right now and understanding what their objectives are um, and, tr- and, and making sure that, you know, we're supporting each other or things are aligned. Um, you just you just can't you can't can over communicate can you that's the thing i mean i'm not spending hours in meetings um but we have to have joint we have got to have joined up thinking otherwise it's just chaos and how do you, you mentioned you're not spending hours in meetings which actually a lot of people we speak to are spending hours in meetings back to back all week long probably yeah. very unproductive do you do something different or are you a, an anti-meeting organization what does your what does your calendar look like if we took a peek at it what's it full of how do you communicate effectively? Hang on, hang on. Can we share screen on this? Uh, no. Oh, <laughs> there are lots of meetings in there. She talks um, the talk. Let's uh, let's see what's on the calendar. Yeah, I, no, it is. It's it's it's. Sometimes I look at it and wonder when I'm going to do any any work. Um, so then I'll have to book out like non meeting non meeting time. But because I work remotely, um, everybody else is together apart from me. Um, and maybe our you know our US teams. So I don't have the luxury of just you know catching up some of five minutes over the desk which I really really miss so I'm very organized and very scheduled and everyone has their time with me um whether that's you know my team or the people that I'm coaching or yeah you know the other business leaders um and we don't you know it might be booked for um an hour or a half hour but it doesn't mean to say we need to use that time so like we we've always got an agenda um and we'll yeah we'll, we'll finish way before if we need to and I try to like finish if it's an hour call on 55 minutes so that I've got, you know, some time, you know, before the next. I, I, I got, I got the hint there. Don't worry. Can you finish on 55? Don't you worry. <laughs> it's right. It's my day off, my day off today. So I, is I, it? I, oh, uh, that's some dedication. For oh, look at that. Honoured. Honoured. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you're right. Okay. Well, so, so you mentioned communication was key. And then in the next sentence said that you're working remotely. How have you found that? Because given that trust and rapport is so important, but only ever seeing somebody their shoulders and above, how do you maintain that relationship where it is just virtual? The relationship piece I find pretty easy. Uh, I just, uh, I don't know, that's just maybe who I am. I build good relationships and yeah, that, that just it works. The, what I find really hard is um, checking that things are, going as I as we have agreed that they should be like for an example unless you actually see somebody in action you don't really know what that you can only go on what they're telling you um and I'm not a micromanager as I've said I will just empower people and trust them um that they can do you know they're going to do what they said they would do and, and and they can do the job and I've been caught out there by not being in the detail enough and I think if I was genuinely there um, it would be a lot easier. Um, plus the fact that it'd just be great to like walk, you know, walk around the office and catch people doing good things and give them feedback. Um, I have to make a conscious effort to find out about good things and then put a nice post on the group uh, chat or I just occasionally send little messages, you know, to say well done. Um, otherwise, you're just really busy and you don't put your head up and then you forget those tiny things that actually make a really really big difference to somebody 
I suppose it makes your life a little bit easier because you're so on top of the, the KPIs and the data as well. Because without that, you're you're operating blind, aren't you? Really, working autonomously from home without knowing who's performing, underperforming, overperforming. It's just a, an assumption and guess. Yeah, and it, the, the, again, you know, the CRM because it isn't just it isn't just looking at the reports, is it? It's you know, because on the face of it, someone could look like they've had a very good day, but actually, when you then look at who they've been calling and the length of the calls and actually the, the, their strategy for that day behind what the surface level data is telling you. Um, it, it, there could well be another story there. Um, but all of these tools are just are just invaluable. Um, and especially for our teams in the US, you know, who, who only get a visit once a quarter, you are managing them through data, really. How often do you meet up as a team? It's quite often we get invited into businesses to help develop leaders at all different levels. But we find out that some of them have never met their team before. They've been onboarded, but actually it's just been virtual. So it could have been six, eight, ten weeks and they've never met their, their line managers. And how can you build an effective team when you haven't got that fundamental trust and rapport there? Do you meet regularly? or? Yeah, I try to meet once a quarter. And then um, somebody may be over from the US or, or Europe for, for those sessions. And if they're not, they'll they'll come in via Teams. Um but then as a as a leadership group, we have a call on a Monday um, every week. Yeah, it's it, it could always be better. There's nothing like being in a room with people um, and having quality time as well. But that's, yeah, that's how we're doing things at the moment. Great. Thank you. Yeah, sir. Cool. Um, Hannah, I've got a question for you. So you before you joined Index, you built, you know, you built a recruitment business that, correct me if I'm wrong, was completely virtual. Was that right? Yeah, it was. So completely virtual. So, I mean, you've mentioned you've mentioned trust as a really important part of, I guess, collaborating and 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 creating, you know, a team of people that that can achieve more than they 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 should on paper. So, what was what was your secret in a fully virtual organization to to creating that 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 trust, um, the bond and the and the performance? And that is the time that we spent with people. Um, and the efforts that we put into those interactions with people um, that they actually weren't used to having. So let, let me explain. When, when I built the team, it, it, it was in the days where um, everybody had to be in the office. You know, like there was, it was inconceivable for a team to be at home. Um, or, you know, and if you'd, if you'd had a client meeting, you should be back to the office, even though there was an hour left of your day. You know that that's the recruitment world we came from. But I, my my team was built on um, a team of what they call VAs um, in the Philippines and Prague, you know, all over the place, um, who weren't used to being treated like team members. They were perhaps just treated like um, an administration assistant um, who was rarely spoken to and the feedback was on an email about the profiles that they'd sent. It was so transactional and that's not, you know, who I am. And I spent a lot of time working with each and every one of them to develop them. And so instead of just being people that would source candidates and send me a long list, um, towards the end, they, you know, they were taking placements all the way through and delivering offers, even to some senior level candidates. Um, but that's the time that we put in to 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 give them feedback. And feedback, actually, it, it was just a key part of that. Feedback, feedback, feedback all of the time. And for me, feedback is actually a development activity in its own right and is really underestimated. Um, but that, you know, that that's how we did it. Um, and they were incredibly loyal because they knew that I really cared about them and their career and wanted them to be better. Um, and they gave it a million percent. Um, never met any of them. Um, and they've gone on to have some great jobs now and I'm really proud of them, each and every one. Amazing. And I, I, look, what I take from that is, and it, it's echoed with other businesses that we know that, you know, operate as 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 kind of high-performing teams in, in a fully virtual kind of environment is, you've mentioned you've got to be really purposeful. Um, you've like You've got to give like feedback, feedback, feedback personal personal time um there, there's an awful lot of, of of trust and having to be really specific in expectations both ways in terms of being deliverable focused but also 
I imagine from what you've just said there, like giving people time, um, it's much more, I think it's probably much more onerous in terms of skill set and giving energy from a leadership perspective than, than it might be if you're in the office, you know, four or five days a week, um, you know, working with someone. So like, how did you personally go about kind of, you know, maintaining your, your own personal energy levels when you're going to have to be giving such a large amount? It's a really good question. And I think, I think at times I probably sacrificed my own energy. Um, and that was a factor in why ultimately I decided that after three years that, um, I wanted to do something else, um, along with parenting my daughter, um, which has its own challenges. Um, I probably didn't look after myself, uh, well enough, I'd say, um, so that's something that I've really, really worked on uh, recently. Um, and it's something that everyone should be aware of because like, you know, burnout doesn't happen to people that are just maybe not happy in their jobs or actually you can be really happy and really motivated and love your job too much um, and get burnt out. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're sat still looking for candidates at whatever time of night. You don't need to, you don't need to be doing that. Um but you can't help yourself because you wake up and just thinking about work. You wake up in the night and you're thinking about work and it, it consumes you. Um, so yeah, you get good results from that, but how sustainable that is, I'm not sure. You need to find balance. Um, so there's a bit of a delay. We had this exact conversation yesterday about burnout and operating in that stretch zone. Uh, we were running our, our K2 exercise and some of the teams were always pushing for that summit, trying to get to the top. And then in the debrief afterwards, that was reflective of the business as well, that they're always in that stretch zone, always operating at 100%. Uh, and, and then we, we discussed it and actually how far more effective it was to operate sort of 80, 90% and be there for the next day, the next month, the next year and continually grow rather than always pushing for that 110% burning out and then the business faults. So yeah, exactly what you just said. Yeah, it comes back down to self-awareness, doesn't it? And really understanding before you get to that point and making changes early on. Hannah, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I think it's it's a really important message for, for everyone who is who is looking to grow something, looking to lead, that actually, you know, there, there's that kind of cliched saying, you've got to put your own oxygen mask on first. But the temptation is, it's very hard to see that and be objective when when you're the one driving something. And so I think, you know, one of the things that, that I would I would echo um, out to everyone who's listening, that if, if you are the person who is driving an organization, whether it's, you know, two people or, or, or you know a thousand people um you need to make sure you're looking after your own well-being um performance as well finding finding someone finding a mentor finding a coach finding someone or a peer group that can that can keep an eye out for you um because otherwise i think the propense the the, te the temptation is to just carry on grinding and carry on going because you don't have anyone saying when was the last time you took a day for you. Um, so so thank you so much for sharing sharing that. Well, it's just like your Ironman training, really, isn't it? Like, oh, Ironman here we go. For, for next week. <laughs> We're doing an Ironman next week. But actually, I, I've never really liked recovery days. And it was only until we got a coach, somebody to tell us that we had to take recovery days and how important and critical to yeah, competing yeah. or hopefully crossing the finish line the recovery day was. Because yeah. without that, I think we'd have just continued pushing and pushing and pushing and, and burnt ourselves out and probably not been able to Cross the start line, let alone the finish line. Yeah. So yeah, that, that just reflects how important recovery days are and not being burnt out in business as well. Yeah, completely. Um, Hannah, we're coming towards the end of our conversation and we have a West Peak question, um, which I want to ask you, I want to ask you now. So for all of those people who are listening for the for the first time or watching for the first time, um, West Peak, our business, um, was named um basically because there are some mountains in the world that have false summits. Um, and there's a, there's a very famous mountain in the Himalayas that has a West Peak and an East Peak. Um, and the West Peak is, is the true summit and the East Peak is the false summit. And we kind of relate this back to skill acquisition or experience. And quite often we all learn a bit of knowledge, think we've got to the summit and then we get there, we go, oh crap, there's a whole lot more that I need to learn. Um, now I know this. So Hannah, I just want to invite you to, to share a West Peak moment of your own. This one also made me think um, quite a lot. And my, my instant reaction to the hat question was um, being a parent, because um, you just you just completely underestimate 
you know, the challenges and that is all leadership really to me um, and coaching and, you know, an awful lot else. But, you know, I, you know, I lost, I lost a baby um, quite late on and had another failed attempt before, you know, I got pregnant with my daughter. And, and so when I finally had her, it was, you know, it was amazing. The first year was full of its usual troubles. Um, and now, you know, with her sort of being diagnosed with ADHD and, you know, and it's, it's, it's been, it's been a real challenge. So that, that West peak is, is, is probably the most significant because I quite like West peaks. That's the thing that got me with that question. I quite like them because for me, if I'm not being challenged and pushed out of my comfort zone, and if I don't have moments of, oh shit, can I do this? Am I good enough? Then I'm not really, I'm not alive. So I, I, it made me reflect because I think sometimes I actually put that West Peak there for myself on purpose. Um, so um, it, it was a really interesting one. Um, but yeah, I think I think my the parenting one is is a West Peak at the moment, and um, where you know I'm I'm working through that at the moment, and also my role um, as CRO because there's I've put a lot of pressure on myself that you know with all of my background, all of my experience, I should nail this job. Like this, this job is perfect for me. It plays to all my strengths. Um, plus the fact that I'm well known at what I do and the people that I'm working with, I coached before. So they thought I was great. Um, I couldn't wait for me to join. And I, I was almost going to be like this magic wand. And then they realized that, oh, Hannah's not a magic wand, actually. Um, we still got to do the work. And there's been moments, real moments where I've like really wondered whether, uh, like, can I no, can I do this? Um, and I, I, yeah, people say imposter syndrome, but that that it, that's been yeah something that I've been fighting with over the last few months, I'd say. Um, and sometimes I wish you could just turn that inner voice off because it really isn't useful sometimes. Um, and I suppose this this challenge of this new role, along with parenting Sophie, the two of them together, have led me to a point of well, how. How do I succeed in both these things at the same time? And the answer for me is to get my brain and body at absolute optimum peak performance. Um, yeah, it, 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 to be at its best. So that's why I've yeah stopped drinking. I'm fasting. I'm meditating. I'm listening to every podcast that I possibly can about brain health. Like I am a different person than what I was. Um, you know, a few months back, and I've never felt such clarity um, or just felt so good as I do now. Um, and it's transformed how I parent and it's transforming how I am at work. Um, and that's how I'm dealing with this West Peak because actually I do have all the skills and background and experiences to to succeed. I just need to make sure that the vessel, um, <laughs> this especially, is, um, is is working in the best possible way. I love that. I've never actually related it back to parenting. You brought up a really good point. We, I mean, we're all parents here as well. And you go to bed every night thinking, yeah, smashed it. We're, I've gone to bed. It's nice and calm. The kids, we're, we're on a good sort of rapport. They wake up the next day and it's all just gone horribly wrong again. There's arguments or something's happened. Something's changed. Yeah, it's a, it's a, a false summit every day. Uh, the other thing you mentioned as well, that you, you're so proactive in terms of uh, like the breathing and listening to your podcast. You haven't mentioned a mentor, someone that you have looked up to either through your journey or now. Is there someone inspirational in the last couple of minutes that you could open up about or, or tell us about? And ideally, we could probably get them on as a guest as well. That'd be amazing. Oh, I like that. Yeah, I like that. Uh, my mum is um, is the the one and only because um, she brought me up in business and taught and taught me everything that I know, but also life. Um, she's she taught me how to dip to get over financial crises how to take a business through that, all the war early warning signs. Before COVID hit properly, I'd already got my business into shape because I could see it coming. But above everything, she she has always said to me, in, in tough times, you sell your way out. That's the only option. Once you've cut costs, how do you sell your way out? And um, she's absolutely right. And she had a motto on in her office where I used to like do my homework. And it said like there was a frog, I think, being eaten by a stork. And it said, you, you never, ever, 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 ever give up. And that is our family motto. Um, and, we, you know, we don't and I won't, not not ever. Um, and they had changing direction, fine, but like never, ever give up. But she's she is my role model in, in business um, and life and, and parenting. Yeah, 
Amazing. Amazing. I really like that. So Hannah, thank you so much for coming on, on how they lead. Um, we've loved, we've loved talking to you. Um, it lived up to, to, to our expectations for sure. Um, and I'm think everyone can take something away from this conversation. I think, I actually think the last 15 minutes of, of what you shared were, were absolute gold. So really appreciate you coming on the podcast and thank you so much for your time. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks very much, Hannah. Thank you. I loved it. Thanks, guys. Thanks for joining us on the How They Lead podcast. We hope you've enjoyed this episode and learned something new about the world of high performance. If you have any feedback or suggestions for future episodes, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. And don't forget to subscribe to the How They Lead podcast on your favorite platform so you never miss an episode. Until next time, keep pushing yourself to reach your full potential and evolve the way you perform. And remember, just because something has always been done a certain way, doesn't mean doing it a new way can't work.